Okay, well, hello and uh, and good morning, and thank you to uh, to you students who have your cameras on. That is um, that is much appreciated. It is uh, so much better to uh, to be talking to to faces and uh, and seeing people uh, rather than just empty boxes. Um, and yeah, if you keep your cameras on through the rest of the quarter, I'll probably uh, you know I'll I'll learn to recognize your face. Um, but um, or I'll try. I'll try my best. I, I should say I'm. I'm actually not super great with names, but uh, but I'll remember your face. Okay. Um. So this is Stats 101C, um, statistical models and data mining. And first of all, I have to start off with an apology. I am still finalizing your syllabus. I'm trying to figure out exactly how much to make, you know, for the grading. Like how much this should be worth and how much of that should be worth. But I'll, I'll give you a kind of a just a brief rundown of what what I'm planning, and then um, and I, I got to just figure out the details. And so um, so that's that's the delay. Uh, basically, um, you know, just off the bat, I'm not planning on doing any exams, there, but there will be final projects. Okay, there's going to be two final projects. You're going to have a regression project and a classification project, and these will be um, done in groups. So um, I'm going to set up this week kind of a like a fine group partners type of thing. And it will be kind of like yeah, disclose as much or as little information as you want. And then um, and then you can try to reach out and uh, and form a group and things like that. Uh, I, I have to set up a campus wire for you to do discussions and things like that. But um, but basically. Um, the bulk of your grade will be determined by these kind of final group projects uh, rather than an exam. And I know group projects can go hit or miss greatly depending on who ends up in your group. So, um, so I'm hoping by kind of having this, you know, find some, uh, find some group mates uh, that that you like. Um, you know that that will help, but um, but it it's always a little bit tough, especially in an online setting. Um, so you know we'll include things like uh, you know what time zone you <laughs> you're currently located in, and uh, you know whether I don't know I guess what times you know you'd be free to meet and things. Otherwise, because trying to coordinate, but but anyway, that's that's all in the future. So um, so anyway, uh, bulk of your grade will be. Um, the final projects. Uh, there will be some homework assignments. I'll have a couple uh, traditional um, homework assignments in that, like I assign problems and you answer them. And then uh, I will also assign a few homework uh, assignments from Data Camp. Data Camp is a website that um, you know offers kind of just some online training modules and things like that. And um, and then an, um, so you got homework, final projects, and then the, the last is lecture view quizzes. So let me explain what a uh, lecture viewing quiz is. And, um, and then once we establish that, then we can get started with the, uh, the material and uh, a little bit of other stuff. Um, but again, my apologies for not getting your, um, your syllabus ready uh, at, the, at, at this time. Um, Oh, and I'm sorry, I don't know if I introduced myself. My name is Miles Chen, and uh, you know, uh, I'll be your, I guess, professor uh, for the quarter. And, um, and I'm excited to teach this class. This class is, uh, I think, a lot of fun. Um, and I hope, uh, I hope you enjoy it uh, as well. Okay, so um, let's see. In the modules, um, you should see, it, I guess it's a little bit different for you, but uh, one of these things in week one, is the week one Monday lecture viewing quiz. Okay. And this is what I will be doing instead of traditional attendance. Okay. So um, this, the class is online recorded, uh, which means you don't have to say attend live per se. Uh, of course, I always prefer when you do attend live. Um, but if you don't, um, the way I kind of try to make sure students at least watch the video recording is by uh, using this lecture viewing quiz. So when you click, um, when you take the quiz, you'll basically just see a few um, 
uh, multiple choice questions, okay? And I will give you uh, the answer during the lecture. So for example, the uh, question one, the first answer is the letter A. So you'll wanna jot this down, question one today for week one Monday, uh, the letter is, uh, the answer is A. And I will give you the answers to questions two, three, and four uh, during the rest of the lecture. And that's to try to encourage you to, I guess, pay attention and, uh, and make sure you watch the video. And so that, that, will, uh, that will be kind of um, a portion of your grade. Uh, you'll also, uh, part of the grade is um, going to be determined on, uh, I guess, uh, we'll have a campus-wide discussion forum, and, uh, and then you get some participation points uh, there as well, okay? Um, again, uh, I'm fleshing out the details, and so I will post that, um, you know, later, hopefully by Wednesday, but, um, but that's what I'm working on right now. Okay, any uh, any questions? I know we don't have any of the details right now, but um, um, I guess maybe I'll post it and then you can ask questions about it later. Okay, um, does the lecture view quiz, does this thing make sense? Okay, one, one very important thing about the lecture viewing quiz is that it closes, okay? Um, it closes by uh, the time the next lecture starts. So our next lecture is on Wednesday at 9 a.m., and so it will close be, you know, at 9 a.m. on Wednesday. So you need to have watched the lecture before the next lecture, and you need to have answered these questions, okay? And it's a quiz. Um, I know it feels like it's a, it's a low-stakes quiz, but, uh, but you know, treat it as a quiz. You know, sharing answers to any other quiz, that would be considered academic dishonesty. And, uh, and the same, same goes for this. So, you know, you're not doing your friend any favors by telling them what the, uh, the answers to the, uh, the lecture viewing quiz are, okay? Okay, um, well, with that, let's go ahead and, uh, and we will take, uh, take a look, uh, whatever, welcome to summer session. So um, this class, we will look at kind of a lot of machine learning stuff. We'll look at a lot of kind of fitting of statistical models to data. Um, and I'm, you know, the way I approach this class is with a great focus on application. I don't know if any of you took my 102B class. Um, if you took my 102B class, um, you know, there's the way I teach that class is there's a decent amount of machine learning. Um, but that one is a little bit more focused on the algorithms and how those algorithms work. This one's more focused on not how the algorithms themselves work, but just like, okay, here's some data. How do we, how do we uh, apply the algorithm or how do we apply this machine learning thing to this thing? Now, one thing about summer is that session C, it's six weeks long and it goes by fast. It goes by fast. Okay. Oh, and then one thing, so, and then we meet twice a week, right? So we have a total of, uh, I guess, 12 sessions. And then um, uh, one of them, there is, uh, we have, mon one of the Mondays is Labor Day. Um, and I, I think I, I don't know if I can afford to lose one twelfth of my course, you know, when I'm, uh, so I might have a makeup on, say, the, uh, the Friday before. Um, I, again, let me, let me figure this out, but just, um, just putting that out there, um, just be ready for a, I guess, a, uh, an extra lecture incoming, um, so that, the, that we'll have 12 total sessions and not just, uh, not just losing one to the holiday. I, I, you, you guys can still have the holiday, but just, um, there's going to be, <laughs> there's going to be a lecture in there. Okay. Um, yeah. I hope that's not too upsetting. Okay, uh, these are going to be the textbooks. Um, I guess there's two textbooks, and then there's just a bunch of documentation that you're going to have to read. Um, so, kind of the the book uh, that we will be using is um, Statistical Introduction to Statistical Learning. Okay, and statistical learning is kind of like it's almost a synonym for machine learning, okay? So it's the idea of, you know, the 
um, you know, you have data and then you basically the, uh, the computer, the machine tries to figure out, you know, how to, what parameters to use to fit your model and things like that. And statistical learning is that same idea, I guess, but maybe it uses a little bit more statistics. Now they just released, uh, we're, we're going to be using this book, the book on the left, Introduction to Statistical Learning with Applications in R. Okay. They just released this year, Introduction to Statistical Learning with Applications in Python. And I know a lot of students want to learn Python. Um, right now, as far as this class goes, Python is not a prerequisite. So I can't suddenly just throw Python on the entire class. Um, that said, if you have an interest in Python, you can take a look at this book and you can try some of the exercises and some of the labs and work through them yourself there, okay? But as far as our class goes, uh, we're gonna be using the textbook using R and then um, the package that we're gonna be using will be tidy modeling with R as uh, or tidy models, okay? And we're gonna be doing tidy modeling with R. So um, so you can download the, uh, the textbook for free uh, right here, okay? And then, um, so that's that. And then the other one is tidy modeling with R, okay? And this is uh, another textbook. And again, this, um, both of these textbooks, you can uh, read for free uh, online, okay? And these are, they're, they're great textbooks. I mean, if you want the, um, if you want the physical book, you can buy it, all right? It's 40 bucks on Amazon right now or something. Um, uh, if you want that, you can you can spend the money. But um, all of the content is uh, is right here in your browser as well. Okay, and this is going to be the uh, the package. Uh, I guess tidy models is technically a, a meta package. It's a package of packages, and um, and that's going to be kind of the system or structure that we will be using to uh, to fit our data. And and it does a lot of kind of cool things that allow you to kind of build a you know data science pipeline, um, which, which I think is, uh, which I think is going to be important. Okay. Um, and then the, the other bit is, will be, um, tidy models itself. The package has, uh, documentation, um, on their website. Okay. And so you can go to tidymodels.org and it says it's a framework. The tidy models framework is a collection of packages. And, um, and basically, uh, as you learn, there's a bunch of, uh, things for you to kind of do. And then, um, yeah, there's, there's, there's tons of things that you're going to have to be reading. Okay. So, um, you know, one thing is, is that there is a lot to cover. <laughs> okay. And I don't have time to cover everything. So I'm going to try to pick, uh, kind of the key things and I'll try to at least get you started so that hopefully as you want to do more, you can go out, read more, and understand how to use those things, right? You can you can read more and learn. So part of this is setting you up to be able to kind of read additional things and figure out how to how to use it um, uh, on your own. Okay. So what did I write? I wrote uh, we're going to work through several chapters of introduction to statistical learning, um, you know, with applications in R, and uh, it is considered one of the best introductory texts for machine learning. Um, but again, we won't have time to cover everything. And then I also want to incorporate the practical tips of forming a workflow using the tidy models package. Okay. Um, some of the homework, uh, assignments and the exercises will come straight from the textbook. Um, I, I do believe that they are good exercises and they have the, you know, they're kind of the right mix of challenging, uh, and doable. Um, that said, because they're exercises from a textbook, if, uh, if you get stuck or something, you can go on the internet and probably with a little bit of searching, find your answers. Um, that that kind of defeats the point of assigning homework. <laughs> uh, the, you know, I, I personally don't actually care if you do the homework, okay? The reason why I assign homework is to give you an opportunity to learn, okay? And, um, and if you look at the solutions yourself, um, that's, that's not going to help you learn, right? It's kind of like um, signing up to go to the gym, okay, and getting a gym membership or something, and then not using, not doing the exercise, right? 
um, you're you're not gonna uh, you're not gonna get the benefit of of having that thing, right? So um, I guess this is what it wrote, right? So if you want to build muscle at the gym, you gotta you gotta work hard, right? You gotta push push yourselves a little bit to the limit so that you know your muscles get worn out, body rebuilds itself stronger. Um, you know, for sports or something, you're not gonna get any better if you only choose to play against weak opponents, right? Um, and the process is similar for for learning. Okay, you you will not learn if all you do are easy problems. Okay, and when you face yourself, you know, force you to force yourself to face, you know, a, a, a more challenging problem. That's that's how you get better, and that's how your brain develops. Okay, so I encourage you to kind of struggle through the process. Uh, you'll get a lot more out of it that way. Okay, so let's. Um, Let's take a look. We're going to start by going through chapter two of introduction to statistical learning. So a lot of these diagrams and stuff that I use in um, my lecture today come straight from the uh, from this textbook. So you can download this. And so this is the textbook here. And we're going to just kind of start with uh, with chapter two here, uh, statistical learning. Okay, so this is kind of the table of contents that I just kind of copied um, chunks uh, from the uh, the table of contents and says, you know, why estimate F and what are we, what is F and how do we do that? And, you know, what is all of this stuff here? Okay. All right. So um, what is statistical learning? So the idea is we've got this data, right? And, um, and you're going to see a lot of matrix notation. I hope we're comfortable with that. Okay. And so we have uh, an input matrix, okay? And we also have output values, okay? Basically an output output variable, it's this vector here, okay? And the idea here, as far as this would be considered supervised statistical learning is that there is, we, we believe there's some kind of real life process or something that's responsible for the values that we see in our output, okay? So let's say, let's say we're looking at uh, people's height, okay? Some people are tall, some people are short, um, some people, you know, are average height and, and things like that. And we say, okay, you know, there is some kind of, I don't know, biological process, some kind of genetic thing, something going on, right? Um, people's heights are determined, you know, in large part by, you, you know, their, their parents' heights, uh, you know, I guess their, their genetics, um, their nutrition, you know, how much, I don't know, did they get enough nutrition while growing up? Um, you know, other environmental factors, uh, you know, things, you know, related, uh, all kinds of stuff, right? There's things that go into determining how tall someone could end up being, all right? And that's going to be our output variable. And what we're saying is that, okay, you know, the real world process <laughs> is pretty complicated, right? Uh, you can't just take somebody's, you know, you could, somebody, I guess, could go to what, 23andMe or whatever, Ancestry.com and get their DNA analyzed. But you can't just take that and just go, oh, okay, well, based on this, we know exactly how tall you're going to be. Right, it, the the process is more complicated than that, um, and really, how how tall you know you see somebody and they have tall parents, you go, okay, well, I expect them to be also kind of tall, but then there's other factors, right? You're gonna have brothers who all have the same parents, and they end up being different heights. Okay, you know, brother or sisters who have the same parents, brother siblings who have the same parents, and things like that, and they end up different heights. How do you how do you figure this out? Okay. So it's, it's kind of complicated. And a statistical model is kind of the idea, well, this is, yeah, the real thing is kind of too hard. <laughs> let's simplify it. And let's just say, you know, we're going to look at uh, a few variables, maybe uh, biological father's height, biological mother's height. Um, I don't know, basically uh, some nutrition score. Uh, I don't know, you know, maybe... I don't know, other stuff, right? And you can say, okay, well, based on these input variables, okay, and we're going to say we've got P of these input variables, 
and we have a total of n observations, so we have this big x matrix, we're going to say, okay, there's some way that relates the input values to the output values, okay? So each column is going to represent some kind of input variable, all right? And then we can, you know, x1 could be um, father, biological father's height, x2 could be biological mother's height or something, I don't know, okay? Um, and uh, and so, you know, if you have uh, 500 people in your data set, okay, each of these x variables will, will have a length of 500, okay? Each row represents um, one person, and, you know, that person will have all of the different values, okay? And this person has their own um, biological father's height, biological mother's height, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And then the entire X matrix can be represented uh, something like this, okay? Uh, a bunch of the columns or a bunch of the kind of the rows, things like that, all right? And this is their output variable. And basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out, okay, what is the relationship between the output Y and those input variables X? Okay, and so we're going to say this is the relationship is that there's some function that takes in those input va values. Okay, maybe it takes the biological mother's height and the biological father's height and takes their average and, you know, adds plus or minus based on nutrition score or something like that. Okay, and we say, all right, this is, uh, this is the function that we're going to use. And then, and then there's some random error. Okay. And there's a, a random error term that just it kind of says, okay, you can have two people with basically the same input values, but those two people might not necessarily have the same output, right? So you could have two, like uh, in this silly example here, uh, you could, I guess you could have two brothers, <laughs> all right? And they might have the same input, right? They're their parents are the same and their whatever, okay? A lot of their things, their nutrition values are the same, but they end up different heights, okay? How do we account for the fact that these two people who have the same input values end up with different Y values? That is associated, that difference is accounted for with the error term, okay? Um, so, you know, here's, here's an example from the textbook. And um, this is some... I think this is just made up data. So don't, <laughs> um, this is not how, how the real world works here, but we just said, okay, we're gonna look at years of education. Okay, how many years of formal education did someone receive? And then what is their income at the end? And, um, and so here, the red dots represent kind of the data. And what we see is like people with, you know, 10, 11, 12 years of education, they have uh, th this kind of income, people with 20 or 22 years of education, and that's a lot of schooling, uh, end up having a higher income and things like that. And what we're saying is that underlying all of this data is there's some kind of true relationship, this, this blue line, okay, that represents um, the true relationship between X and Y. Um, and, you know, in reality, this blue line it's unknown to us, okay? And that's what we're trying to figure out, okay? We're trying to figure out the blue line. Now here we have it graphed because again, this is made up or simulated data, okay? Um, and, but even in the simulated data, you have the, the actual relationship, but again, not everybody, not every single value fall, falls right along this thing. You have some, some uh, variations, some what we call error, not that we've, made a mistake, but you can have this person who has, uh, say, 20 years of education, and this person who has, say, 21 and a half years of education, okay? According to this true relationship, the person with more education should make more money, but, you know, in our data, we find that the person with 20 years of education actually makes more money than the person who has 21 and a half years of education. So, so that kind of discrepancy is accounted for with the uh, the error term. Okay, so you know, in in essence, what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out, okay, well, what is this blue line? Okay, because this is going to be kind of our best guess for what the relationship is. How do we figure out what this this function f is? Okay, and um, 
And the reason why we want to figure this out is because, well, once you have that, this function, this blue line, whatever it might be, you can make uh, predictions using that. And that's probably going to be the most important application. But then also learning something about that, um, that, that relationship F can also give you some insight, okay, or uh, allow you to make some inferences on uh, the relationship between the variables, okay? Um, so, you know, in a lot of these kind of situations, you have the input variable um, available, but we don't have the output yet, okay? Um, and so, um, and that's okay, <laughs> all right? And we're just gonna say, well, can we try to predict what the value of Y is? And we're going to just say, well, you know what? On average, we're going to assume the error terms are zero. Okay, on average, right? So you, you know, here's our here's this silly this example here, and you know, this individual who has 20 years of education has a little bit of an error term. They're not exactly on that. But if we had in, if we surveyed another person who has the same input value, okay, another person with 20 years of education. They might be a little bit above the blue line, okay? And if you surveyed a whole bunch of people, we're just saying on average, if you averaged it all out, that error term should be around zero. So in that case, our best prediction for what Y is going to be based on our input variables is going to just be plug the value into our function F, okay? Now, we don't have... The, so you have all of these hats here, okay? And basically, the hat just says, this is my estimate of the thing and not the actual thing, right? So there is some true function f. We don't know what that true function f is. Um, and our estimate of that function is gonna be f hat, okay? And, um, and in a lot of these situations, we can treat this estimate, the function that estimates this thing as this mystery black box. We don't actually care what's happening on the inside we just want it to make good predictions. As long as it's um, making good predictions, we're happy with the uh, the system that we have. Okay, and that's kind of how a lot of like neural networks work. That's how a lot of you know algorithms um, and things uh, work. And you know, uh, there's a lot of kind of uh, mm, well, I, I don't know, uh, a lot of stuff. There's a lot of algorithms at play, right? And then people just say, oh, you know, the uh, the YouTube algorithm is, uh, I don't know, feeding me all kinds of content and this and that. And the problem is, and, well, and then you have, you know, people wanting to push regulation and things. And, and I'm not saying, that, you know, that's either a good or bad thing. But one of the issues is, is that we don't actually, a lot of people don't actually know what is happening inside the quote unquote algorithm, okay? Uh, it's just kind of like a human brain. Um, we don't actually really know how the human brain works, okay? There's a lot of kind of things and we can say like, okay, this part of the brain is responsible for vision and this part of the brain is responsible for emotions and things like that. But we can't just say, okay, well, here is one person's brain and here's another person's brain. And, um, they're going to see, uh, we're going to show them this image. How is this person's brain going to re react? And how's that person's brain going to react? Okay. We can't, we don't, we're not there. Okay. We don't, we don't know how it works. All we can say is, okay, we're, we're going to show them the image and then, um, and then this person reacts this way and that person reacts that way. And we say, okay, well, you know, maybe we were able to predict that maybe, maybe we weren't. Okay. Um, we don't really know. And, and right now, um, we actually, the, the algorithms that be, decide what video they're going to show you next on YouTube or TikTok or whatever it is, um, we don't actually know exact, exactly how those things are working. All we know is, uh, you know, they're, the, they're being evaluated on basically, did the person stick around and watch the video, right? And, uh, and basically, if the person sticks around and watches the video and allows the next video to come, like, they get a, you know, that's like a, they get points that that's a, that's a good thing versus if they, uh, if they scrolled away from that video 
or um, quit the app or something. Those are those those would be negative things. And um, and basically these apps and algorithms are designed so that okay, as long as they keep the user engaged <laughs> on the platform, it's a good thing. And uh, and we don't actually know what's happening. All it's just saying is that okay, whatever whatever content this person created, it's um uh, it's keeping people engaged. So let's keep feeding that. Okay. Um. So you know we don't we don't actually know what's happening. And as far as kind of the um the functions uh, in that you know that's that's probably not the goal. They just want good predictions. They just want to pe keep people engaged. Um, and you know what that says about society and whatnot. You know that that's an entirely different thing. But um, but that's that's kind of how it, how it's working right now. Okay. Um, so how does how accurate is this going? Okay, the accuracy of y hat as a prediction depends on kind of two quantities. Okay, and there are two parts. There are I guess two kinds of error. There's reducible error. All right, and so the reducible error is the error between our model, okay, which is f hat, and the actual relationship f. Okay, so remember we're assuming there's some true relationship and we're trying to create like a model of it. And the reducible error is how can we get our model to be as similar to the true relationship? And if we can get our model to be almost exactly the same as the true relationship, that that's as good as we can hope for, okay? And then um, the irreducible error, okay? This is just the residual error that um, isn't even captured by the true model, okay? So the true model F might be this, but there's still some kind of leftover error where you can have, again, two people with the same input values X, but they have different values Y, right? And so the, that true model still doesn't capture all of the, uh, the output, and there's still some kind of leftover error. And, that, and that's our irreducible or a residual error. OK, um, and so even if we get this part, the reducible error perfect, the irreducible error uh, will not ever truly go away. OK, and so here we can say, well, what is the uh, the the expected value? OK, expected value between any uh, actual observation and our um, prediction. Okay, so the expected value between the actual observation and our prediction, okay, is going to can be broken down into these two parts. The reducible error, which is going to be the um, the difference between the um, the actual function and what our predicted function is. Okay, so here let me I guess let me back up. So any actual observation y is going to be um, the true function plus error, okay? And then um, and the difference between the actual observation and the our prediction. Our prediction is determined by our kind of our our estimated model, right? And so the difference between the true function and the estimated model, okay? This is the reducible error part, okay? But then you know your um, uh, e squared, okay, the expected value of e squared is just the variance of epsilon or or u here, okay, and that's that we can't get rid of, okay. This is uh, this is this because uh, the expected value of uh, e itself is a zero, right? So it's normally um, you know variance of x is expected value of you know x minus the mu uh, quantity squared, and uh, and here the the mean of a uh, uh, epsilon is zero. So that's going to just be the variance there. Okay. So we can break down, you know, what's the difference between the actual value and any prediction. Okay. The, uh, the, the squared difference, the expected squared difference is going to be the reducible error plus our irreducible error. Okay. Let me go ahead and give you your second view quiz answer. The second view quiz answer. Uh, can I, uh, let me see. OK, 
So that's uh, question two. This is supposed to be a parentheses, I guess. OK. Um, so you know, we um, the other part, so I said we want one uh, reason why we want to estimate um, the function f is for predictions. The other part is we might want to estimate the um, that function for inference, okay? And we might be actually interested in how is x related to y, okay? So making good predictions is uh, is desirable. Um, sometimes having interpretability might be more important, okay? And so you know you might want to know, all right, which which of these predictors, which of these predictor variables are associated with the uh, the outcome, the response, okay? Or you might be interested in what is the relationship between um, the output, the the response variable in each, each of these predictors, okay? Or can we, you know, can the relationship between y and each of these predictors be summarized using, say, a linear relationship? Or do we need something more complicated? Like, do we need to apply a log transform? Or do we need to, you know, make it a quadratic function or square root or do some, some other kind of thing? Do we have to make, you know, some other polynomial or whatever it might be? You know, we, we might be interested in um, in that kind of thing, right? And and depending on your data, um, you can you can learn stuff. I mean, and this is this is basically like <laughs> Newton uh, when he was studying gravity and things like that. Basically, recorded data and set, and came up with kind of this uh, you know squared relationship, right? Where he says, "Oh, okay, you know, um, you know." Uh, I don't know, the force of gravity, uh, you know, has this kind of, you know, 9.8 meters per second squared uh, type of business, okay? Uh, he, he recorded this uh, this relationship and, uh, and, you know, and so that inference of basically fitting the data with this kind of quadratic equation um, or quadratic, yeah, uh, quadratic form, um, you know, reveals a lot of kind of insight that was that was useful um you know for for later studies and helped us understand uh gravity and uh you know the solar system and things like that so there's certainly an application and a need for having uh, understanding these relationships not just being able to make good predictions but like revealing uh you know the inner workings of some of these things okay so how do we go about doing this okay well there's a ton of uh <laughs> A ton of methods, and we will we will touch upon uh, some of them. Um, but we're going to assume that we've got kind of um, this uh, pairs of uh, basically input values and output values, and this is what we call our training data. So we're going to say each of these things. So here it just looks like one value, but this this little x one here is actually a vector of values, right? Uh, if you have, you know, five input input values, there's, you know, there's five values inside this x1 here, okay? So it says, uh, this is the p length vector associated with observation i. So there's, you know, perhaps five values um, tied up in this x1, five values uh, associated with uh, the first observation, five, five values associated with the second observation, so on and so forth. And then each of these have some kind of output value, okay? And uh, and that's y1, right? And what we want to do is we're going to apply some kind of statistical learning method, which is what the rest of our course is all about, um, to try to um, estimate what is this unknown function, okay? And um, and broadly speaking, okay, um, and there's all kinds of different ways on how to um, divide our learning methods. But we can say our learning methods can be parametric and they can be non-parametric, right? Later on, we'll split them and we'll say these are regression methods and classification methods and things like that. But right now, um, we're going to say there's parametric models and non-parametric models. Okay, so what's the difference between uh, a parametric and a non-parametric model? Okay, parametric models will say that estimating that function f, okay, the, the true relationship between our inputs and our outputs, 
is a matter of estimating parameters, okay? That's why we call them parametric models. And, um, and there's kind of two parts for how you would fit a parametric model. One is you have to uh, make some kind of assumption for the functional form of F, okay? That is, you have to figure out what are the parameters that we should even be estimating in the first place, right? So a simple example is you're gonna say, okay, we have a linear relationship between our input values X and, uh, and the output, okay? And so we're gonna say, okay, we're gonna take, uh, we've got some intercept and we have a, you know, a beta term associated with our first X variable and our beta term associated with our sex, second X variable and things like that, right? And you, and you covered, you learned about linear regression um, in what, 101A? And, and that was, you know, that was a big, uh, that's an important thing. And, and, you know, these X, you know, X2 itself could be like <laughs> the X1 variable squared or something like that, right? So, um, but they're still kind of linear, um, you know, the overall uh, form of the relationship uh, themselves. Uh, itself is a is a linear combination of these things, even if say x two is um, you know you're taking the x one variable and you're squaring it or doing something to it. Okay, and uh, and and so that's just one functional form. You can have you know more complicated functional forms where um, maybe they're not linear related. Um, so even like a neural network per se is a bunch of kind of uh, you're, you have input variables and you have some kind of strange functional form, okay? Not strange, not that strange, but basically just a, a series of whole bunch of matrix multiplications, but you do have some kind of functional form, right? And it's a matter of figuring out what are these parameter values? What are the weights that should be used in this neural network, right? I think right now, I don't know, chat GPT is some giant, giant neural network, just this big, large language model uh, with, you know, perhaps millions of parameter weights, okay, um, the current trained model. But basically, they're saying, okay, you know, <laughs> the, uh, the relationship has this, you know, crazy form, and there's a whole bunch of parameters, and uh, like, you know, a million, millions of them, and, uh, and they, they have a good set of weights where yeah, you know, we can put in some input values and uh, input text, and it and it generates pretty decent output text. Okay, um, but uh, that that's what we have, right? So, um, so first you've got to make an assumption about the functional form, and then the second part is okay. Well, once we have this form that we like, let's figure out what parameters, what those weights should be. Okay, and that's what training. Training your model means, right? Training, um, you take your data, the training data, and you train the model. And what does it mean to train the model? Training the model just means figuring out what your parameter values should be. What should your beta weights be? Your beta zero, beta one, beta two, maybe your one million beta values <laughs> that you got to figure out. And how do you estimate those things? Um, that's what training the model means, okay? Uh, linear regression straightforward, right? It's what X transpose X inverse X transpose Y or something like that. Um, I think you do that in 100 C. Um, I don't know if you guys have taken that or, you know, um, I guess for one, 101 A, you're to, to figure out what your weights, you know, your slope and intercept should be. Basically, you're just finding the uh, slope and intercept that minimizes the sum of squared residuals and things like that, right? So that's a, that's a fairly simple way to to estimate your parameters um but you know other models estimating these parameters maybe um it's a little bit more complicated right so yeah ordinarily squares regression uh minimize a squared error function um and we got other ways right so that's that's the parametric um parametric models for estimating parameters um that's that's pretty um that's that's going to be a lot of our things okay this um so the, the parametric approach basically says figuring out F is a matter of figuring out uh, the parameters that we, we need to do, okay? And, you know, by saying we just got to figure out the parameters, right? 
is usually a lot easier than trying to figure out the actual uh, some arbitrary function, right? Uh, a lot of the heavy lifting in using a parametric model is uh, a lot of the heavy lifting is done in that initial step of saying, this is what I'm assuming the functional form to be, okay? But if you do a bad job, right? If the functional form that you're assuming if you're saying, I'm assuming there's a linear relationship between x1 or between our x variables and the output, and that's wrong, <laughs> then, then you're going to run into problems. Okay. Right. So, so a big part is picking that functional form, the, the thing that relates the input to the output. But if you do a bad job with that, then, then your, your thing's going to suck. Okay. And so you might say, well, that's too much pressure. <laughs> I don't want to have to pick the model, OK? Um, let's just let the data speak for itself, right? And, um, and I, I, in general, you should be willing to, um, I guess, go on a limb a little bit and, uh, and figure out uh, what, what, what model you should use. But in some cases, you know, um, you don't have to. And you can just pick a kind of a very flexible model that can meet all kinds of different shapes of F, not just limited to some linear relationship or something like that. Um, and, um, and you can say, okay, well, let's have a, a whole bunch of flexibility. Usually uh, you're gonna have more parameters there, right? So you, it's basically just making your model more and more complicated. So you have a whole bunch more parameters to, to have in there. And that could lead to another problem called overfitting. And overfitting is the idea that now you're starting to model the noise that exists in your data, right? So, um, so for example, um, you know, we're we're trying to predict height, okay? And we have, uh, you know, we have brothers that have basically the same input variables but one's a little bit taller and one's a little bit shorter. And, uh, and probably a good model would just say, you know what, that's just randomness, right? That's just some random noise. Sometimes people end up a little bit taller and sometimes people end up a little bit shorter despite having the same input variables, okay? Now, um, perhaps you say, well, you know what? I wanna, um, I wanna capture more information. And so you start recording other variables that, um, you know, that exist. And you might say, okay, um, this, this brother, uh, his favorite color is red. And this brother, his favorite color is blue. Okay. And now, uh, now we're going to predict people whose favorite color is red to be taller and people whose favorite color is blue to be shorter or something like that. Okay. And that might improve the fit on your particular data. But is that something that's going to generalize well to the rest of the population? Probably not. Okay. All right. So now, now you're starting in your model to, to include the noise. And you're going to say, well, um, everything else about these brothers, their input values are the same, but we're getting different values here. And so to improve our fit, we're going to tweak it a little bit by saying, okay, well, when we factor in what their favorite color is, okay, now we can explain why one person is taller and one person is shorter, okay? And that might improve your performance of, of the model on this particular data set. But then when, it, when you take it out into the real world and you say, okay, I wanna know all of this information about you. I also need to know what your favorite color is. And, uh, and based on that, I'm gonna adjust my predictions. That model probably won't do so well, right? That's overfitting your data, okay? That's overfitting um, and you're saying the noise in your data is now part of your model. So not, not a great thing, okay? Um, and, and, and so we'll talk about how to kind of avoid some of those situations. Um, the other kind of models that we have, non-parametric models, don't make any kind of assumptions about the functional form of F, okay? And um, so... You know, parametric models, we said, okay, we got to just figure out these parameters. We got this linear relationship between your input variables and our output. Okay, non-parametric -parametric models, 
We don't have any assumption about the functional form. Um, we can fit a wide range of shapes, okay? Um, and we also avoid the, pro uh, the problem of having, uh, having the wrong you know, uh, form of the model, right? We're not going to say it's a linear model or quadratic or exponential or anything like that. So we just say, all right, you know, just fit some kind of thing. A lot of times a non-parametric model might be something like, okay, I have a whole bunch of observations when, you know, X1 is 20. So I'm just going to average of all, of all of these observations together, all right? And that's going to be my best guess. And then when X, X1 is 22, I have a whole bunch of observations and I'm going to take the average and that's going to be my estimate for basically when X2 is 22. And basically you're just kind of, you know, estimating a model kind of like that. Uh, the, the issue with non-parametric models is oftentimes it requires a lot of observations, okay? A very large number of observations to obtain uh, an accurate estimate of F, right? So if you're going to just say, you know what, let me go back to this thing. Rather than trying to figure this out, we're just going to take, okay, you know, I'm going to take all of these observations uh, in this kind of, this window here, and I'm going to take the average. And I can take all of the observations in this window and take the average and all of these observations, you know, you know, from 10 to 12 and take the average, 12 to 14, take the average, 14 to 16, take the average, 16, to 18, take the average. And I'm just going to kind of average them out and I'm going to just kind of connect them with a smooth line. That could work. OK, but what if uh, in, in one of these segments, you only have one or two observations? OK, then your estimate there is probably going to be, um, you know, subject to kind of a lot of variation and uh, variance based on, uh, you know, what, what random values show up there. So, um, so non-parametric models generally require a lot more data. Okay. Okay. So here's kind of an illustration, um, of, of some of these concepts that we've talked about. Okay. So this is, uh, again, simulated data here. And here we're going to say there's two values. We're going to take in the person's, uh, so there's the value we're trying to predict is someone's income. And then the other thing that we're trying to predict, uh, and the values that we're using to make that prediction about income is years of education and seniority. Okay. And so, um, so let me go back. Going back to this slide back here. We just had one input, years of education, and the output was income. And we had this kind of this S curve looking thing. Okay. Now we have a um, now we have two input variables. Okay. So this is people with very few years of education and low seniority. Seniority kind of being like how long have they been working on the job? Okay. So you know, somebody, this person who like didn't graduate high school and just started working. So their income is going to be low, right? Over here, okay, is somebody who has many years of education and has been working for, I don't know, 20 years, okay? And so they're, they have high education, high seniority, and they're kind of at the top. And then, you know, we have kind of this, this blue surface, okay, represents kind of the true relationship between input, uh, between the input and the, uh, the out, outcome, okay? So, you know, as years of education goes up, the, uh, the income goes up, and as seniority goes up, the, uh, the income goes up, but the relationship is, you know, there's like this little S curve, and there's kind of, you know, some surfaces of steeper increase and things like that. Um, and, uh, and the red dots themselves are the actual, um, actual values, right? And, uh, and there's little lines that kind of show like, okay, this is the, uh, the income and, or, or where we're expecting it to be and this line is this dot is above the, the surface and this dot is below the surface and things like that okay so um you know as good as this fit is there's still some um some deviations some error between um what we what we pre, uh, what the true relationship is in blue and what the um what the red dots are okay so this is this blue surface represents the true relationship Okay, this, okay, this is a, a linear model, okay, a, uh, this would be our estimate, 
this is an example of one way to estimate the relationship between years of education, seniority, and income. So the true relationship has kind of these, these curved, curved lines. Mm -hmm. And over here, the, uh, the true relationship is, uh, I mean, our estimated relationship is this linear thing, right? So when you plot a linear relationship, basically it becomes a flat surface, like a plane, okay? And overall, it captures the overall relationship, which is fewer years of education is lower income, more years of education is higher income, fewer years of seniority is lower income, more seniority is higher income, okay? All right, and so, but, but it's just kind of flat, right? So the true relationship is this curve, okay? And, uh, and you know, the red dots have a little bit of error there. This flat plane represents, you know, one way that we could estimate it, okay? And, um, and we have this, okay? So th this is a, a linear estimate of the true relationship, okay? Um, we could also try this. This is a non-parametric called thin plate spline model, all right? So we might look at um, spline models. And basically, this just says, hey, you know what? Take the data and try to uh, try to fit it using kind of like a smooth surface, okay? And, um, and we say, okay, well, you know, this does a, I don't know, is it better than this? Probably it's better than this, right? What's what's closer? Is it close? This this is the true thing. Which does a better job of the true thing? This thing or this thing? Okay. Now we go. Uh, I guess this one does a little bit of a better job than this. But this is you know it's also not a hundred percent accurate, right? So if you look at the relationship on years of education, the true relationship is kind of this nice smooth curve, a nice smooth curve over here, and you know, we have these nice, we have smooth curves, but, you know, the, the surface isn't exactly, um, isn't exactly perfect either, okay? But this is a non-parametric one, and maybe it does a little bit of a better job, right? If, uh, depending on, and, but it's also <laughs> subject to the data that we have, and that, that's also going to be the case for, uh, for anything here, okay? So, um, so this, you know, these are just a couple examples of just like this illustration of, you know, this is one possible model, okay, for fitting the true relationship, and all we're doing is we're just basing our models based on the, the data that we have, okay. This is uh, another thin, thin plate spline model, okay, and here we change the restrictions a little bit, and we said, you know what, it doesn't have to be super smooth. But what we want you to do is fit the data as closely as possible, okay? So the data and all of these things have been the same, okay? And, you know, here we said, keep it smooth. And so this is the, the estimated surface. This one we said, fit the data as closely as possible. You can see our, the surface this has, there's very, very little um, kind of residual between the red dots and the surface, right? So here, you know, if you see a little vertical black line, <laughs> that's your residual. Here we have basically no residual, okay? But what we end up getting is this weird, um, <laughs> this bumpy surface that, um, bit, uh, that overfits our data, okay? It doesn't do a good job. If, if the true model is this, this one doesn't do as great of a job because now we're saying like, okay, as your years of education goes up, sure, um, your income generally goes up, but watch out. Uh, if you go from here and you go a little bit higher, your, uh, you know, your income goes down, right? Um, as years of education goes up, okay? Um, uh, as, um, so you have, you, you, know, you kind of have these weird, weird little features because we overfit our data. We say, okay, you know what? Um, <laughs> If you go from, you know, let me just kind of back, uh, reverse all the way up here. It's kind of just like saying, okay, if you have 19 years of education, you're going to have a high income. But then if you have 21 years of education, it's going to go down. All right. And, and, um, and that's basically just because you overfit your data a little bit, just in your data, you happen to get, um, uh, have a few 
people in your data set were, you know, 20, one year, they had 21 years of education and yet their income was a little bit lower than the people with 19 years of education. And so that gets modeled in your data. Um, and that, that means you've overfit, uh, you've overfit your data. Okay. All right. Um, so what, what are we trying to do is we're trying to, um, figure out, um, I'm, I'm so sorry, uh, one, one moment, please. <laughs> 